Namaste. I don't know what to call this video. <laughs> Maybe a title will come up in the narration. We'll see. So recently it has occurred to me that why I'm doing these video series, huh? why am I doing all this? Because I don't really want to be a guru. I don't really really want to have lots of disciples. What to speak of maintaining an ashram and all those headaches. Confirmed. <laughs> That's my pet. He's come this just this morning. I fed him a big handful of peanuts. He loves it. So anyway, why am I doing this? Well, it's really just to help people, just to give something. I don't expect anything back. And there's another motivation too. I was doing all this research and all this spiritual practice to overcome my suffering. The, the physical suffering hasn't been too bad in this life. I have pretty good karma. But the emotional and mental suffering has been severe at times. I mean, if I look at myself really deeply, what am I? I'm a Sahaja Yogi. Uh, I'm a natural Tantrika. I've always been from the very beginning. And of course, there isn't much support, especially in the West, for full Tantra. They're only interested in the sexual part. And that's maybe, I don't know, 2%, 5% at the most of actual Tantra. Actual Tantra is vast, huh? but Western people aren't interested in all of it. In fact, they just use it to justify what they're already doing, which is basically uh, taking drugs and having sex. <laughs> so they use it to, to justify that. And their actual philosophy is something like nihilism, atheism. I don't believe in anything. I don't follow any authority, I don't, you know. I'm completely independent and uh, I don't need any rules or any uh, background or tradition to support me. Huh? I, could, I just have my body and its needs. That's a very poor, very limited platform for spiritual growth. But I mean, it's kind of the same thing that happened with yoga in the West. Now it's just an exercise form. It's got nothing to do with consciousness. Even though in the very second shloka of the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, he says yoga means stilling the vrittis. Vrittis are the modifications of the mind, the modifications of consciousness. And because of that, we are in conditioned consciousness and we can't escape the round of birth and death. But I mean, the modern so-called yogis and tantrikas in the West don't even really believe in a round of birth and death, reincarnation, rebirth, whatever you want to call it. They don't even believe in that. It's a non-issue for them. Huh? You only live once, they say. What nonsense. So, as a, as a religious tantrika, you know, a spiritual tantrika, I never found any satisfaction in the West. And I never found a partner who was adequate for my needs. See, Back in 1976 and 77, I, just after my guru passed away, 
I was recruited, actually, by a, a Kashmiri Shaivite sect, and I visited them, lived in their community for some time, and I was trained in actual Tantra, the complete spectrum. So then when I came back to the West and tried to teach, I was completely frustrated because these people only wanted like, you know, 2% of what I had actually knew. So, and forget finding a partner, nobody was qualified and nobody wanted to become qualified. Well, what do I mean by qualified? I mean they had an accurate perspective on the actual scope of Tantra and the actual purpose of Tantra, which is to worship the goddess within our own bodies as Kundalini Shakti. So, of course, nobody in the West was even like close to that, you know. Now, somebody will write in a comment claiming to be like that. And, you know, that's fine. Maybe I missed you, you know. Or maybe there were people around who knew all this stuff, but were just keeping quiet. You know, there's a number of possibilities. But in any case, I could not find a qualified partner or one who was willing to become qualified in the West. So then when I moved back to the East, I left U.S. last time in 2005. So for 15, 16 years now, I've been out of U.S. I went back once or twice just for business, just for a few days, but then I left again. Now, I find in, the, in India, the opposite is true. <laughs> People are spiritually very sophisticated and knowledgeable, but sexually almost illiterate. You know, thanks to the British Raj, they introduced their, you know, anti-sex culture, and it's still very deeply embedded in India. I don't know why, but India seems to absorb the worst qualities of, of its uh, invaders and colonists, <laughs> colonizers, and um, make them a part of its own structure. Well, to be honest, there is a deeply ascetic and... Um, anti-materialist vein or uh, social circle uh, centered on the Vaishnava scriptures, which are very dualistic and very much in denial of the conditioned creation, the impure creation, as Lakshmi calls it in the Lakshmi Tantra. So, Against that background of asceticism and sannyas as complete and total celibacy, there has grown up a culture of anti-sexuality. I mean, to the point where the Uttar Pradesh police just published a notice that every time you search for porn in Uttar Pradesh, the police will get a notice of it. I mean, that's, that's so backward. That's like, you know, India is generally 50 to 60 years behind the West in social trends, but that's like a century or more. <laughs> anyway, South India, no worries. South India is cool. South India is much more, uh, do your thing, baby, and as long as you don't hurt anybody, Nobody's going to have a concern about it. So that's very nice. It's a much more relaxed situation, um, like between the Hindus and the Muslims, for example, or the Christians and everybody else. And there's even Buddhist temples springing up now in South India, some of the bigger Buddhist organizations. So that makes a social environment that's more open to sexuality. But still, it's very much secret 
what's going on outside of ordinary, you know, missionary position, vanilla sexuality, even in South India. But what I have found, because I've had a lot of people, I've advertised discreetly, you know, over the years for Tantra partners. And some people have applied. And one or two actually made it through the screening <laughs> and uh, visited me. But of course, I quickly found out that they were uh, impossible to teach. They weren't, they weren't trainable at all. And they were very much stuck in a particular view. So that didn't work out. But now, you know, over the last two or three years, since I've been following the Sri Vidya path, my consciousness and health and even my financial situation has improved tremendously. And just looking at it and looking back at the rest of my life, I, was, I would think, you know, why did I wait so long to get into this? This is great. So it also pointed up the fact that why anybody does anything and specifically why I was doing so much research and practice and this and that was to eliminate my suffering. I had a lot of suffering because of growing up as a very atypical person in a very social conformist environment. Even though, I mean, I searched out the pockets of really broad-minded, open-minded people, but still they weren't broad-minded enough to fit me in. <laughs> like I said, the people who were into sexual Tantra were not into the rest of it at all. And the people who are into Eastern religion were into some weird atheistic, nihilistic interpretation or misinterpretation of it. And a lot of that is also here in India, but there are a, a much larger group of really sincere practitioners and yogis and like that. And a lot of them are here in Tiruvannamalai and I love them, I respect them very much. And I always support them with charity and stuff like that. But beyond that, in my personal case, as I uh, reduced my suffering, or I should say, as the goddess reduced my suffering uh, over several years of Sri Vidya practice, I found myself less and less motivated, less and less driven. You know, and now, well, something wonderful has happened, first of all, that someone has uh, come forward to be a Tantra partner who is actually qualified. And this is amazing, you know, because I've been looking since you know, I was in my 20s. And uh, what's that, over 50 years? Oh my God. And finally, I found someone who's qualified, uh, both in the material and spiritual ways, and has a broad enough outlook. They're willing and, and eager, actually, to grow into a fuller understanding and practice of Tantra. So we're still in the negotiation phase, <laughs> confirmed. But within a week or two, I hope we're going to meet and start to explore the practices together. So this is a big, big deal for me. It's basically the only desire, worldly desire, I have. And I have to be honest with you, a little bit of the motivation for starting this channel and doing all these videos has been to meet somebody like that. But it didn't happen through this channel. It happened through another uh, forum that I'm a member of that is uh, open to such topics. So anyway, uh, I'm basically, I'm, I'm very much free from suffering and anxiety now, more than I ever have been in my whole life. And this brings up another observation. 
that the people that you see online or in magazines or whatever, TV, pushing very hard some organization or some spiritual practice or path, building an organization and like that. Why are they doing that? Because they're suffering. <laughs> and the more they're suffering, the more driven they are to bring this thing into existence, basically as an extension of their egos. I know, I've been there, I've done that. I got the t-shirt and I got the scars to prove it also. Because the people who are going to approach you when you start something in that mode are, well, a lot of them are just, you know, doofuses, just dummies, right? In innocently thinking they're going to get something in exchange for their donation or their so service or whatever. But there's a small group, about 5% of sociopaths who are climbers and who want to use you and your organization to increase their social status so that they can do their numbers. Confirmed. <laughs> and so I experienced this in my days of being a so-called guru. Huh? <laughs> in spades right Bertie <laughs> my good old peacock he's sitting on the front wall huh? shouting at all the cars going by anyway so um, I experienced this and I have no doubts whatsoever that this is the dynamic that's going on in most spiritual groups because every spiritual group I've been a part of, that has been the dynamic. So I think the real, actual realized people aren't going to be doing much outreach. They're not going to be doing any big programs and recruiting lots of students and you know, building big organizations and all like that. That's for the neurotic people who are suffering and trying to find a way out and think that, well, I'm a little sadhu, so if I become a big sadhu with a lot of social credits, that'll make me more self-realized. But no, it doesn't work that way. What it does is it just pulls you away from your practice and you stop making any advancement. And then you get this big load of karma that has to be experienced one way or another. In other words, it just leads to more suffering. But in the case of someone who's actually overcome their suffering, where's the motivation to recruit disciples or to teach big classes or to hold seminars or build a community or have a big organization? There's no motivation for it because why? I'm not suffering. I'm happy. I'm satisfied with my life just the way it is. So why should I bother? Why should I go to all the trouble? And especially if I have a little experience in life, I should know that that kind of big effort only leads to suffering. So in my case, what that means is leading up to the big reveal here, right? That once my partner and I get together, and let's assume that everything goes as planned and then the relationship is successful, um, where is my motivation to make more videos? What to speak of, you know, reviving the course site and all like that. So what I'm saying is I'm, I'm passing over the kind of the leadership of this channel to you guys. Like the, the, over the last couple of weeks, I got a couple of really good questions. And because of that, I was able to make videos based on those questions. And uh, I hope the people, uh, you know, the viewers who originated those questions 
are getting a lot of benefit from that. Because I've really, I've already said everything, you know, everything from, from uh, existentialist materialism all the way up to the highest Keval Advaita and Nibbana. I've already said everything. What more can I say? But if you start posting good questions, the channel community tab, on the channel page or uh, as comments on a video or videos, then I'll have something to base more videos on, right? It'll be like a motivation to continue this channel. So please engage and respond. And then we can continue this dialogue. Aung Tatsat. Aung Shakti Aung.